is God consistent? I think that's a question that we all have to deal with at some point in our lives as we come into the faith. We have to wonder, is God really consistent? What are the things I can count on from him? You might say in, in modern parlance, you might say, what is God's brand? Does he have a brand? You know, it's, what are, what are the defining characteristics that, that you can count on? Does he have traits we can count on all the time? Well, in the Bible, there is a moment in time when God speaks to a man and he says, he kind of reintroduces himself and he says, I am God and here's what you need to know about me. These are my traits. This is what makes me, me. And then that, that passage becomes a reference point after that in the story. For the next thousand years of biblical history, it keeps getting referred to again and again. The psalmists sing it over and over. There are leaders of Israel who speak to God and they say, this is what you said that you are, so what are you going to do in this situation? So let's turn to Exodus 34 and we'll take a look at this passage. In fact, this passage is the most quoted scripture in the Bible by the Bible. So the biblical writers, this is like their John 3.16 in a way. This is the one that they keep coming back to. Exodus 34. And it's, this is at a, a key moment in time. Uh, almost just before this was when Moses went up the mountain, Mount Sinai, and God speaks to him, and he shows him his glory, and he says he's got to put his hand in front of him, and he's in the cleft of the rock. This is shortly after that, and God comes down and speaks to him again here in Exodus 34, starting in verse 5. It says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. Now, wait a second here. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, 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 Lord. What is, what is this telling us? Well, this, this kind of repetition is a, a technique. It's telling us to slow down. It's telling us this is really important. It's like this is the point in the story where you come into bullet time. You're like, you know, and this right here is a mountaintop moment. So it's really important. Then he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. That's if you have New King James. Another example, I think, uh, and perhaps a more consistent way to render the Hebrew with other passages is the Christian Standard Bible, which says, the Lord, the Lord is compassionate and great, is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Oh, by the way, let's, I see it's up here. I've got this slide here that, that maps out some of this. This is a, uh, uh, a little bit different way that this is worded. A lot of translations, depending on what you have, might word a lot of these, these things a little bit differently here. Uh, Christian Standard Bible, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and, and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Now, if this was the first time you ever read this passage, it might raise a lot of questions, and some of them we can't fully get into. Verse 7 in particular, this language of visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children can sound a certain way to our ears that is probably not quite the right, right idea. It's not saying that, that God judges the children for their father's sins, but we don't have time to take that, that side trail. That would take another 20 minutes, so we'll have to leave that one for another day. But this passage is the one that gets repeated over and over and over. In fact, uh, here are a few examples that you could jot down. I'll read them quickly. You could just jot down the reference if you want. Psalm 145 is an example. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing along of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Psalm 86, Moses, or not Moses, David is on the run from his enemies. He says, O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Joel 2, which is, this is a famous verse in its own right uh, that you've probably heard quoted before. Joel 2.13 says, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness or steadfast love, and he relents from doing harm. In fact, there's 
here's an example of a place where this is referenced in a conversation of what's going to happen next. Moses, whenever they come up to the promised land, Israel doesn't believe. They don't, they don't believe that God's going to take care of them, and they're afraid to go into the promised land. And, and God says, that's it. I'm, I'm going to disinherit you. You do not believe that I'm going to take care of you. And Moses intercedes for Israel. And he says in Numbers 14, he says to God, Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people. He's saying, therefore, since you said that, here's what I'm asking based on your your long-suffering, your slowness to anger, your mercy. He says, pardon the iniquity of this people, like you say that you pardon iniquity. I pray according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. In fact, even in the New Testament, it shows up. John, for instance, in the beginning of his gospel, he starts out with this story to introduce who Jesus was, who the disciples were living with, and he hooks it into all these things in the Old Testament. He starts with, in the beginning was the word. And then partway down, he makes this reference where he says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only one, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And those are some key words, the beholding of his glory and the grace and truth, which is linking back to this moment in Exodus 34, where we are. In fact, one of the most surprising references to this that you get in the Bible, I think, or it's one I enjoy a lot, is in Jonah. Whenever God has Jonah go to Nineveh, and you know Jonah goes in the city and he says, uh, you know, this, the city's going to be overthrown. God's judging you. And Nineveh actually repents. And, of course, Jonah's thrilled about it, isn't he? He's not thrilled about it. And this is the surprise. Uh, whenever they repent and God's not going to destroy Nineveh, he turns to God in Jonah 4 and he says, uh, well, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So he takes the most encouraging parts of the passage and throws it in God's face. It's funny, you have to laugh so you don't cry at what's going on with, with Jonah there. But this is a really interesting passage. You can go on to the next slide here that I've, I've kind of, it's a little bit more diagrammed out. Let's see, I don't know if you can, got it there. I know it looks a little bit complicated here, but it's made up of a couple of uh, poetic structures. Hebrew, the Bible in Hebrew uses a lot of what are called chiasms, which are just like, you take two similar thoughts that are, are clearly in parallel, and you put them in parallel And then you put things between them, like a sandwich or an onion. So you've got like this onion you keep peeling back, or this ring structure that keeps building to the center point. And that's something that you're often highlighting. And this is what's happening here. There's actually two chiasms back to back, and they're linked by this central idea of God's unfailing, loyal love. So the first one is verse 6. And it's got these, these five really powerful terms for God. It's talking about being merciful and gracious, and those are, are similar ter- terms. In fact, they rhyme in Hebrew. It's rachum vechanun. And they're both, they're both verbs, and there's a lot of overlap in their ideas, so you clearly see that as a unit. And then the other part of the, the sandwich in verse 6 is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, which are also, they don't look in English like linked ideas, but they, there's actually a lot of overlap in them in Hebrew. They're both nouns. The way the sentence flows, it's, it's obvious what's happening here. And so they're used to set, a, set off this thing in the middle that God is slow to anger. It's a very central aspect of his personality. But then that's linked to this other side. That first side is really focused on God's mercy and his love. But the second thing is saying that there's a whole you know, other side that you have to understand about God, and it's about his justice. That uh, while keeping steadfast love for thousands, or your translation might say thousand generations, that's in parallel with this line on the bottom, the third and the fourth. Those numbers are in contrast to each other. 
And uh, it's saying, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the, gu- the guilty. And this, these two central parts of these two chiasms are meant to be lined up then. So you see that there's this tension that happens. It's not a tension in God's character. He doesn't have a tension within himself. We create a tension whenever we sin. And now a merciful and a just God has to deal with us. And so it puts these two ideas together. One is that we have a God who's slow to anger, and, one is, and he does not clear the guilty. If you don't repent, you remain guilty. He wants to forgive. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, but he doesn't clear the guilty, and he lets them sit in that guilt and lets the consequences of that guilt compound as it naturally does and build up, and unfortunately that affects generations as, as people are left in their freedom to be guilty in that way. This word, slow to anger, by the way, is very literally, it's long of nose in Hebrew, which I think the idea there is that when you're angry, your nose gets hot. So you have a hot nose if you're angry. So if you had a long nose, it would take a long time for that nose to, to heat up. So there's a lot happening here that's, that's showing that there's a lot of facets that are in tension here. And what this is showing us is that uh, if you read the Bible through the lens of just one of these traits, it's going to be confusing. In fact, you're going to think maybe that God is inconsistent. You might even find him to be capricious because you're trying to read it and say, okay, well, I know that God is merciful and that's all he is, or I believe in a just God and that's all you see. That's not going to work when you read the Bible. You have to understand all the facets of this and realize that they are all actively in play at once. And if you do that, the whole rest of the story of Israel through the Old Testament into the New Testament is going, to, is going to make way more sense. So in many ways, this passage is a Rosetta Stone for understanding God's interactions with humanity throughout the Bible. So I would encourage you to tune your ears to this phrase as it pops up again and again through the Bible. In fact, you might even, one thing I've done, I guess, is um, I've found in the last year or so is I've incorporated it into my prayer a lot of the time because you've probably heard at different times we've talked about um, the Lord's Prayer and how Jesus gave it to his disciples as a model and as kind of a template that you can use for how you pray. And the first part of it is, you know, our Father, hallowed be your name. So we often start our prayer with praise. And this has been kind of a further template for me that has helped me to to work through these things, just as David and the psalmists and many other people did as well. They would work through this this process of considering God's mercy, his graciousness, his slowness to anger, his steadfast love and faithfulness or truth, and uh, that all of these aspects are in play and they're worth meditating on to see what God has done. You know, I've started so many read a Bible in a year plans over the years that I dropped out somewhere between Judges and Obadiah, I think. Maybe maybe that's happened to you too. And this is the kind of thing I think that has has really helped me is to try to find the through lines, to try to find the themes that stay active through the whole story. So then I can see that it's not just a big book of isolated stories and incidents, but they are all tied together. It's like a, a continuous conversation with God, through these different people, through their different weaknesses, that's gradually building out a portrait. It's building out a portrait of what Jesus does as the Messiah, and a portrait overall of God the Father's nature and character. So, we get that portrait as God deals with flawed people, with flawed families, with flawed nations, and the question it keeps forcing us to consider is, how will a God who is both just and merciful Go about redeeming an evil and a corrupt humanity. So let's be aware of God's consistent attributes. What we can, what we can count on God to be like. It's, it's these things. We can have faith that God is what he says he is. He's compassionate, gracious, long of nose, abundant in steadfast love and faithfulness, not clearing the guilty, but maintaining loyal covenant love for all those who love him and keep his commandments. <laughs>